Chapter 18 In the Hall of the Potter With these words, the pilgrim Carmenita brought his narrative to a close, sat silently and gazed meditatively out upon the landscape. And the Lord Buddha also sat silently and gazed meditatively out upon the landscape. Lofty trees were to be seen, some near, some farther off, some grouping themselves in shadowy masses, others dissolving airily in cloud-like formations and disappearing into the mists in the distance. The moon now stood directly over the porch and its light shone into the outer part of the hall, where it lay like three white sheets upon a bleaching green, while the left side of the pillars gleamed as though mounted in silver. In the deep silence of the night, one could hear a water buffalo somewhere in the neighbourhood cropping the grass with short measured jerks. And the master pondered within himself. Should I tell this seeker all I know of varsity? How faithful she was to him? How, without fault of her own, she was forced to marry Satagira by low fraud? How it was her doing that Angulimala appeared in Ujjaini? And how, owing to that very visit, he himself, Karmanita, is now treading the path of the spiritual seeker instead of sinking into foul luxury? Should I reveal to him the path that Varsity is following now? But he decided that the time was not yet come and that such knowledge would not be helpful to the seeker in his efforts. The master therefore spoke and said, To be separated from what we love is suffering. To be united with what we do not love is suffering. When this was said, it was said of such an experience as yours. Oh, oh how true, called out Carmenita in an agitated voice. How profoundly, deeply true. Who, stranger, uttered those profound and wonderful words. There's no need to be concerned about that, friend. It is of no consequence who uttered them, as long as you feel and recognize their truth. How could I not? They contain in a few words all my life trouble. Had I not already chosen a master, I would seek none other than the admirable one with whom these words originated. Then you have a master whose teaching you acknowledge, friend, and in whose name you have gone forth? Um, in truth, brother, I went forth in the name of no master. On the contrary, my idea at the time was that I should win my way to the goal unaided. And when I rested by day in the neighbourhood of a village at the root of a tree or in the recesses of a forest, I gave myself up with fervour to deepest thought. To such thoughts as these, what is the self? What is the universe? Is the self eternal and the universe temporal? Is the universe eternal and the self temporal? Or, why has the highest Brahma caused the world to come forth from himself? If the highest Brahma is pure and perfect happiness, how does it happen that the universe he has created is imperfect and is afflicted with suffering? And when I gave myself up to such thoughts, I reached no satisfactory solution. <laughs> On the contrary, new doubts constantly arose, and I did not seem to have neared by so much as a single step the goal for the sake of which the noble-minded abandon home forever and voluntarily become homeless. Yes, friend, the Buddha replied, it is as if one were to pursue the horizon, thinking, oh, if only I could reach the line that bounds my vision. In the same way does the goal escape those who give themselves to such questions. Carmenita nodded thoughtfully and then went on. Then it happened one day, when the shadows of the trees had already begun to lengthen, that I came upon a hermitage in a forest glade, and there I saw young men in white robes, several of whom milked cows, while others split wood, and yet others washed pails at the spring. On a mat in front of the hall sat an aged Brahmin, from whom these young people evidently learned the sacred songs and sentences. He greeted me with friendliness, and although it would take, as he said, scarcely an hour to reach the next village, he begged me to share their meal and to spend the night with them. I did so gratefully enough, and before I laid myself down to sleep, I had heard many a good and impressive utterance. On the following day, when I was about to go on my way, the Brahmin addressed me with, Who is your master, young man, and in whose name have you gone forth? And I answered him as I have answered you. Upon which the Brahmin said, How will you, friend, reach that highest goal if you wander alone like the rhinoceros, 
instead of in a herd and led by an experienced leader, as is the way of the wise elephant. At the word herd, he glanced benevolently towards the young people standing round about. At the word leader, he appeared to smile with much inward satisfaction. For, he went on, this is indeed too high and too deep for one's own comprehension, and without a teacher it must remain a closed book. On the other hand, the Veda, in the teaching of Shveta Ketu, says, Just as, O beloved, a man who has been led blindfold hither from the land of Gandhara, and then has been let loose in the desert, will strike too far eastward, or it may be too far to the north or to the south, because he has been led hither with his eyes bound, but he will, after one has unbound his eyes and said to him, There in that direction live the Gandhara, go hither, ask his way from village to village, and reach his home, richer in knowledge and wisdom, so also is the man who has found a master to direct him to the land of the spirit. Such a man can say, I shall have part and lot in this world's turmoil until my liberation comes, and then I shall go to my real home. I saw at once, of course, that the Brahmin was planning to secure me as a pupil. But this very desire of his destroyed any confidence which might have been awakened within me. On the other hand, I was well pleased with the saying from the Veda, and, as I went on my way, I repeated it over and over again to myself, in order to fix it in my memory. In doing so, a sentence occurred to me which I had once heard used regarding a particular master. The master does not crave disciples, but the disciples the master. What a very different man he must be, I thought to myself, from this forest Brahmin. And I longed, venerable one, for the master who was above all such craving. Who is this master whom you have heard so praised? What is his name? It is brother, the Samana Gotama of the Sakya clan, who renounced the throne of his fathers. This master Gotama is greeted everywhere with honour and with a joyous acclaim. He is the Blessed One, the Holy One, impeccable in conduct and understanding, knower of the worlds, teacher of gods and humans, the Enlightened One, the Buddha. And I journey now in order to find that sublime one and to acknowledge myself as his disciple. But where, friend, does he now reside, this sublime, this enlightened one? Far to the north, brother, in the kingdom of Kosala, lies the town of Savati. Just beyond the town is the richly wooded Jetavana Park, filled with mighty trees in whose deep shade, far from all noise, the wise and faithful are able to sit and meditate. Its crystal pools ever exhale coolness. And its emerald meadows are strewn with myriads of vari-coloured flowers. Years ago the rich merchant Anatta Pindika purchased the grove from Prince Jeta and presented it to the Buddha. It cost so much money that, if spread out over the surface of the ground, it would have concealed the whole property. There, then, in this delightful Jetavana, over whose meadows the feet of so many of the wise have passed, the master, the fully enlightened one, at present makes his abode. If I step out bravely, I hope in the course of about four weeks to have accomplished a distance from here to Savati and to sit at the feet of the master. But have you ever seen him, brother, this blessed one? And if you did see him, would you recognize him? No, brother, I have not yet seen him, the blessed one, and if I saw him, I would not recognize him. Then the master reflected, for my sake, this young seeker is now on the way. He acknowledges himself as my disciple. How would it be if I revealed the heart of the Dharma to him? And the master turned to Karmanita and said, The moon has just risen over the porch, and we are not yet far into the night, and too much sleep is not good for the mind. If it's agreeable to you, I can offer, in return for your narrative, to unfold to you the teaching of the Buddha. Oh, that would make me very happy, brother, and I beg you to do so if you're able. Listen well then, my friend, and reflect upon what I have to say to you.